Now, move that down a little bit. I started to say, I think the pastor was trying to get on my good side playing that song with bagpipes sound in it. That's, that's Scottish. That brings the Stuart out in me real quick, like. But anyway, I thank God for standing here this morning, being able to, uh, this afternoon, and being able to bring a message that God's laid on my heart many years ago. God's given me this. I've shared a little bit with some with the pastor in passing, and really I've shared it with just about anybody who listened to me over the last 20 years. But there's a message here that I want to bring, and it's funny how that, or ironic how the Lord works, mysterious how He works. I've already heard the, the pastor say, you know, ask the for you to breathe in and and and, uh, and and breathe out, and you know he's talking about breathing. Uh, seen thing the words of the music of faith and 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 grace and these things mentioned, and that's the things that I'm going to speak about today. Actually, I've got about five or six sermons I'd like to speak about today. <laughs> to be honest with you, I could go in five or six different directions with this. You know, I would want to speak on warfare. I'd want to speak on uh, work. You know, I'd want to speak on breathing, you know, living. There's things, that, all kinds of things here I could speak on this morning. If you would, if you have your Bible with us, if you'd turn with us, I'm going to be reading out of Galatians 2, verse 20. 2, verse 20 of Galatians. Here Paul writes, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, many of you may notice I've read out of the King James Version, the old King James Version, and some of you may have different translations, and it may say, by the faith in the Son of God. And if you have one of those translations, it, you know, it says in or of, and there are those today that would have us argue with one another which one's right, because they know it can't be both. Today, the Bible has a term for those kind of people. They're called Nicolaitans, where they would come in and drive a wedge between you and I and try to divide us and separate us and cause us to argue and fuss and fight over this one little two-letter word, faith of. I will want to point out here that, that the... the the faith of versus the faith in. By changing that word, you change whose faith it is and the direction in which faith flows. Okay? Best way to describe this is it come to me. You know, I was a young man. I was working in a prison, and some boys, some inmates there were standing on the wreck yard, and they brought this question up. And back then, I was one of them people, boy, I'd, I'd fight you over this King James Bible. I was one of those people. And so I pointed out this verse to them and the difference between in and of and how they've changed it and all this. But as a boy walked up, he had a basketball in his hand. And I said, let me show you the difference. And I took the basketball from him. And I said, if I place air in this basketball, I went... <sighs> but if I said, if I take air of this basketball. I said, you see the difference? The difference between in and of. And so it got me thinking. And it's like the Lord just right there standing. I'm trying to make a simple you know, example of, of, of you know, to show him the difference. And the Lord opened my eyes almost immediately as far as faith being like oxygen. I got to thinking about it. Faith like oxygen. You know, we breathe in. The air in this room today would be, if it would be able to be measured, would be somewhere between 21 and 22% oxygen in this air. You breathe in, they say 21.5% oxygen. You breathe out 16.5% oxygen, meaning that you get to keep 5.5% oxygen in your whole entire body functions all of its functioning occurs, the strength, the energy that you have is from 5.5% of oxygen that you're given. That's all we have to use. 
And I studied that, and I got to watching. I opened this is the, during the winter time. I opened up my fire. I had a wood stove, and I'd open. I'd watch that fire burn. I started thinking about oxygen. I started thinking about heat and fuel. You know, you've heard the words the fire triangle. If you've had any fire experience or fire extinguishers, I see hanging on the wall here. Uh, of training, any of that type of training, you know there's three things that a fire must have to burn. It must have heat, fuel, and oxygen. So I started thinking about faith as oxygen. I do want to read one more portion of scripture here before I move on. In Galatians chapter 2, it says in verse 8, For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So we see here that it is the gift of God. The very breath we breathe is the, ver is, is the gift of God. And so I want to correlate it with the breathing, physical breathing, with spiritual breathing. How do we live? And Paul says here, the life which I now live in the flesh. How do you breathe every day? Or how do you live every day? One breath at a time. Breathe in. Breathe out. If you sit down to relax after a hard day's work, what do you do? <sighs> That's the first thing we do, is let out that breath. And I know Brother Jonathan can, can testify to this. If you're lifting weights and exercising and working out, you must breathe right or you will pull a muscle. You will lock up somewhere because you're telling this muscle, hold the breath, but you're trying to tell the muscle, Move, hold the breath, move, and the muscle just, you know, one muscle pulls against the other and tears the weakest muscle. So you end up, you end up hurt, sore because of it. And I got to thinking, if you'll look over here in Corinthians, you'll find there's three mention. First Corinthians 13, 13. And now faith, uh, abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. So you see here, faith along with two others. So this got me to thinking of faith, hope, and charity. Again, I see that hope, faith being our oxygen, hope being heat, and then charity. And this, again, some scriptures or some uh, the Bibles would say love, but the word is not just love, it's love in action, it's love in deed, it's love that's got hands, you know, it's love that does something. It's, it's, it's something, it's a love that's a motivator, that motivates you to do. And so you see here, I see here what I could preach on fire, just from this scripture here, and go into all these things about fire, about faith, about hope, and about charity that you must have. You know, people will say today, we need a revival. We need to be revived. Well, what happens if you are, the breath is knocked out of you or you hyperventilate and you pass out? You need reviving. You need, you know, get one of them ammonia things and break it open and wave it under your nose. That little offensive odor will wake you up. Will get you up. Oh, what happened? I passed out. Well, that's kind of really what I want to do today but I want to take it somewhere. There's a place I am going with this. It may be like one of the country roads back here in the mountains. It may curve and go up and down and around, but I'm going to, I promise you I'm going to try to get you somewhere today in this, with this message. Because, again, I want to show you that, you know, what does the Scripture say in Romans? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. But what also does it say there in Romans 10? With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So what's happening? You breathe in, you breathe out. You hear the Word of God, you must speak the Word of God. And that's where I think a lot of Christians, and especially in the churches I've been raised in, oh, the pastor is supposed to speak the Word of God. The deacons are supposed to do this. The preachers are supposed to do... But what if the preacher can't do your breathing for you? I mean, if he is, it's because you've passed out and he's doing mouth to mouth and he's fixing to do CPR on you because you, you're fixing to die. 
So that's the importance of this, is understanding that each and every one of us must hear the Word of God, and each and every one of us daily must speak the Word of God. And that's where I'm trying to go with this and what I'm trying to show with this. But back to the, the, the fact that we get to keep 5.5% of that oxygen to where we have our strength, our being, we exist off of that 5.5%. And I say, you know, you'll hear this and talk, and what does the f number five mean in the Scripture? Have you ever heard or seen or, or a preacher tell you what the number five means in Scripture? Well, I'm one of these guys, I like to deep dive the, the YouTube channel, you, see, you know, and listen to this preacher and listen to that preacher, and you'll hear all kinds of strange things out there. And, but it, it's in a way that's funny and in, in a way it's sad. But, but five, some will tell you that represents grace, which I, I believe that, yeah, that's true. Some will tell you that five represents death, can represent death. Yeah, I can see where they get that. But five represents what? Your hand. More importantly, the hand of God in Scripture. You see that the, the five represents hand. The opening hand is God's grace. We talk about God lifting us up, picking us up. That grace that's offered, that gift that's offered, but what happens with the withdrawing of grace? When God decides it's enough and He withdraws His grace. It's a principle called five into one. And a lot of people, a lot, especially preachers, they'll read 1 Samuel 17 and they'll say, well, why did David take five stones but only use one? What they miss from reading in that scripture there is that David put it, those five into something and then put it into something. And they don't know. It's a, one, it's, it's a shepherd's, and the best scholars I've read after say it's a shepherd's device. It's a, something that a shepherd would use. And then one, they'll say that we put it in a shepherd's purse or a shepherd's bag. And again, you read different translations and they'll read different. They don't know, scholars don't know what, why David put those five into something and then into something else. But I will tell you this, that I was, back in 2004, I went to South America and I was, I was you know, I love missionaries. I love everything about missions. And I'm always watching things about foreign nations and different cultures. I love different cultures. And I was watching a thing on Peru because I'd just been to Peru and I'd come back and it's like my whole heart and mind was on Peru and South America, Bolivia, and that part of the world. And I was watching this thing, and it showed this Peruvian woman cleaning the bowels of a lamb, sheep, that she had slaughtered, and she was cleaning it. And within, those, and within that bowels as she was cleaning it were five pellets that I saw. And it's like, just like when the prophet went down to the potter's house and said, watch that potter's wheel turn. I'm going to teach you something. It's almost as the Lord said the same thing. Look at that. Look at that. I'm trying to show you something. Five into one. Now, this is Stuart theology. This is what I see, again, as a former Marine, you know, knowing a little bit about ballistics. What I believe David did, he took those five stones. He took a piece of sheep's gut, the bowels of a lamb. You think, well, why is that? Well, go into your scripture and see how many times you see the word bowels of compassion, bowels of mercy. Why does the old King James use that word, wording? But I believe what he'd done is he tied one end of that bow. He dropped those five stones in it. He tied the top end. He put the two ends together and tied them together. What he made was the fist of God. He made, that's what he made. That's what he's representing. He came in, in the name of the Lord. He took that and he put it in his shepherd's bag. And as he ran to that giant, he put that stone, those five stones made into one, in that sling, and struck that giant. Okay? Let's get a quick a picture of what David was doing there in, in first. You can turn there, 1 Samuel 17. His father had sent him with food to his brethren. You know, David wrote later in his life 
that the Lord provide a table before your enemies. Well, here's what his brother's sitting there eating parched corn, cheese, you know, bread, you know, they're eating while David's doing business. But they're sitting back here, possibly 100, 150 yards away. They were down in the valley, him and the giant, and another 150 yards out of an arrow's reach were the, the enemy's lines. So what did the enemy see happen and take place that day on that battlefield? Again, five, the number of grace, the hand of God. They didn't see what happened. They just seen the boy raise his hand up and maybe point to that giant, and that giant, that round, hit him in the head, crushed his skull, most likely snapped his spine here, or severed his, uh, the uh, brain stem. That giant fell to his knees, and what does the Bible say? Fell to his face. Face. And so here you've got a little boy, the anointed of Israel. Remember this, he's already been anointed king of Israel, and their champion, their giant, just, he just bowed before the king. And what does he do? David walks up, pulls the sword, cuts his head off, steps up on his body, and shows everybody his head. Look here. Look here. Everybody look. And so here the Philistines are thinking, our champion just laid down his life, just bowed down before him and didn't cut his head off. You think about that. You know, think about the PTSD as those survivors of that battle. As they went running back to get, I said, I don't know what happened. He was, he was talking real big one minute. Next minute, he just laid down and let him cut his head off. Just let him cut his head off. They couldn't explain it. The natural man can't explain the things of God. Never can, never have been able to, never will be able to. So again, I said, this is one of the things I could take this message and talk about the grace of God, talk about that hand of God, and I could preach that, I could bring that out, but I just want to skip over it, slide, you know, mention it and move on. There's the importance of breathing that I want to bring about, the importance of, of hearing the Word of God and speaking the Word of God, I'll, the, the most time I think the Lord has helped me the most is when I was working third shift at a data center, sitting on the data center floor with nobody around but me and my little New Testament. And I would just get up and I'm at a, a metal detector. There's nobody coming and going at that time of night, maybe a maintenance man ever, ever so often. And I would read the scripture as if I was Paul, I'd take this 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 epistle, and I'd read it as if I was Paul in prison, in chains, dictating it to Timothy or to Luke or one of these guys that traveled with him, and I would, what they call is uh, interpretive reading, that's what it's called in drama class. We had to do that in drama class and do an interpretive reading as if I'm the one speaking, if I was Paul speaking that, and I'm speaking the Word of God. And I think there's days that we need to do that as believers, as Christians, is when we're studying the Word of God. We're not getting, we're not, I'm not trying to get anything out of it. I'm not trying to force my will or my opinions or my ideas on the Scripture. I'm just reading it as it was written. Speaking it. There's power in the spoken Word of God. And that's what we must understand, we must see, we must come to know that we must hear the Word of God, we must speak the Word of God. You must breathe spiritually or you're going to pass out. And so I want to bring this about again, if I could tie it all together, I don't know if I ever would ever do a the job, a good enough job is what I've seen in my mind to bring forth, bring it forth as I've seen it. Because again, as we breathe and we inhale and we exhale, as that faith, as that oxygen is there, as that hope is there, as that charity is there, as, as that heat, fuel, and oxygen of the fire that dwells within us, how does that fire keep growing? How does it keep, you know, how does it keep getting hotter and hotter? You know, you've got to, if you've seen a blacksmith and the, the blacksmith's helper, he's sitting there pumping that, 
bellows to get them coals hotter and hotter so he can forge that steel. You know, how does all that play together in our minds and in the Scripture and through the Word of God? And I'm thinking about fire, and it takes me to Gideon, story of Gideon, where they had these little lamps, and they put them, they had a little clay lamp and a little, just a little bitty flame, but they stick it into an earthen vessel. Basically what they've done, if you understand that story, they've taken a large mouth jar, if you've got a large mouth ball jar at the house, I know Miss Shifford, she probably got several. She can show you, take your whole hand, you can put it inside that jar. I like them washing. My mom made me wash them. I had to wash them out in small mouths. I don't like small mouths. You can't get your hand in there. can't get them clean enough. But I put, you know, and I got to thinking about that, that they put that whole earthen vessel over there, and there's only 300 of them. But they're all carrying a lamp. They all got a sword, and they all got a trumpet. And again, as a Marine, I can teach you all kinds of things about that, you know, and, and how that every fifth round of a machine gun is a tracer round. It's an it's a, it's a, it's a incendiary round. You can see it. If you've ever seen a video or a movie where you can see a, a string of bullets going out of that machine gun, that's a tracer round. But you know there's four more bullets that you can't see within that? There's a principle there. Gideon's principle, this is a principle that Gideon used. I don't know how many Midianite, how many of those people that they, how they done it, but every so many, so many men would carry a lamp and everybody would follow him and follow that guy with the lamp, you know, because it's the middle of the night. Every so many men would have a trumpet. You know, this battalion have a trumpet and blow to get that trump battalion to move, get this battalion to move. So, so many men, one trumpet represents so many men. I don't know the mind of the Midian night, what he was thinking, but when he woke up that night, and all of a sudden they broke them, them earthen vessels, and these lights are all upon them, 300 lights surrounding them, it could represent 300,000 men in their mind. That I do not know, again, how many men per lamp it would have took in their days. But this is what's happened in this scenario and I want to show you these things so that you know in, in, in your life and the things that you face daily that that earthen vessel is broken. And that's when the light was seen. That's when the trumpet was sounded. The importance of times that you feel at your most brokenness. Pastor and I was talking earlier about that blood clot. And, you know, we get old, we just feel like we can't do anything anymore. You know, sometimes you feel like you can't do anything because of, of your age. Body's not working. You're just tired all the time. But there's one thing you're doing every day. You're still breathing. You can still hear the Word of God and speak the Word of God. You can still let those little lights shine, as the song is a children's song saying, let my light, let the, you know, our little light shine. We used to sing in, in, in church when we was kids. You know, we can still make a sound. We can still tell people. I tell people my, my testimony as a little boy. You know, they can't argue your testimony. We could argue this Bible and theology, and we can, you know, each be like them Nicolaitans and divide it up and, and you know, section it off and take a side and, and fight and never get nothing accomplished. But there's something they cannot argue is your testimony, what the Lord has done for you. And I tell people, as a little boy, a seven-year-old little boy, I had another a little boy come up to me, stick his hand out to shake my hand at a church, and he says, hi, I'm Ben Carper. And so I shake his hand. He says, are you saved? I'm like, uh, uh, no, uh, my, my brother's saved. He's 10. When I get 10, I'll get saved. Because that's the way my mom was saying. I was too young. He goes, well, I'm saved. Well, he's a little bitty fella. Well, how old are you? I'm six. He goes, how old are you? I'm seven. Now, does that sound like a big theological discussion? Does that, did, did, he, did he read any scripture verse to me? Did he tell me of anything, you know, you know, 
theological of any way, all he said is, I'm saved. Are you? He didn't know what I was already going through. As a little boy, I, like, I was already under conviction. I knew I had to be saved. But, you know, what did he do? He just let his little light shine. All he did is just speak. That's all he did. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. It's just to breathe in, breathe out. Hear the Word of God. Speak the Word of God. Speak the Word of God into someone's, in someone's, to someone's life. And you might not know what they're going through. I will tell you this story. One time I was at a service, and the preacher is preaching, and, and it's the, one of the first times I ever felt it. Like, you know, you hear preachers talk that someone here needs to get right with God, as if they feel it. They know it. Well, how do you know, preacher? But I'm sitting in service, and I feel like, well, I'm feeling the same way. There's somebody here that needs the Lord. And he said, look. And so I turned and looked. And there's a boy sitting back on the side. And the church I was at the time, the choir loft was over here. And I sat with an old deacon at the corner of the choir loft as a young teenage boy. And he told me to look at that fella. And he goes, go speak to him. I just went, Brother Larry, is there anything I can help you pray about? That's all I said to him. And if he was here today, he'd tell you this himself, his testimony. He left church that day and never came back for two years. Scared him to death. He thought I knew every sin he had ever committed in his life. God scared that man to death. But when he came back two years later, he is tired of running. He was tired of fighting. Lord, save me. Whatever you got to do, save me. And all I said is, can I help? Can I pray for you? Is there something I can help you pray about? So it doesn't take a theological degree to speak when the Holy Spirit says, speak to that man. Speak to that young child. You know? That's all it takes. That's all we need is to be obedient to the Lord, hear when he, says, when he says something to us, and then he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. See, we think about the Ten Commandments. That's what we always think about the Ten Commandments. Well, I've kept them. You know, I've kept them. I'm good. I'm, I'm good to go. But that's not necessarily what he's talking about. He says, when I speak to you, do what I ask you to do. So that's what he's wanting every day from us. He wants to speak to us daily. And let's do daily what he tells us to do. Let's respond to that voice. Speak his words. He wants us to breathe in and breathe out. It's that simple. It's that easy. Breathe in, breathe out. It's nothing hard. You know, I was going to get off into this, and I was going to talk about the, the, uh, the Lord as, you know, as Jesus Christ as being our kinsman redeemer, and he's also the avenger of blood. I was going to delve into that and totally forgot it until just now. <laughs> you know, the Jew, to this day, they cannot see Christ as the kinsman redeemer. They still want an avenger of blood they want somebody to defeat these world kingdoms around them. They want somebody to defeat Rome. You know, they want somebody to, to make them the head of nations and not the tail anymore. They don't want to be the last, the smallest. They want to be the best, the biggest. And they're looking for that avenger of blood, not the kinsman redeemer. But I think sometimes Christians, we focus on his as kinsman redeemer, but we don't see him as avenger of blood. Who's going to give an account for your life, for your shed blood? You're going to die one day, 100 years old, in your bed, asleep at night, but your blood will be shed just the same. Just as the embalmer embalms you and your blood is going down the drain, who's going to give an account? That closest kinsman is going to come and ask who's, who's responsible. He's going to come. He's going to find out who's responsible for your death. 
He's going to want to know. Why are you dead? He's going to want to know that. Who killed you? Who's responsible for the shedding of your blood? And especially since he laid down his life for you already. You don't need to die. Oh, Brother Tim, we all passed through the grave. Yes, but do we all, are we all dead spiritually? Do we not have promise of eternal life? We do. Through Christ. Anyway, there are so many sermons I could, I, there's so much I want to bring out and I could bring out. But I guess the Lord only wants me today to dis discuss the fact that are you breathing? Are you hearing? Are you speaking the words of our Lord? That's the thing I think I want today the most is to understand that it's not just the pastor's job to stand and speak. It's not just, you know, it's everyone. I can't do your breathing for you. If so, then that means your own life support. We got machines that do that physically for you when you're in the hospital. They put you on life support. So my question today is, are you on life support? Is you, are you waiting for someone to do your breathing for you? Or are you going to accept the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you going to allow that faith in to do its work and that great, to deliver that grace that's needed for salvation? That grace, that 5.5% that gives you your life and your being and, and all the energy that's within your physical body, are you going to allow that to do its work in your heart? Anyway, I know this has been kind of, it's not been the message I thought I would deliver. I thought I'd get up here and it would be exciting and it would be, you know, all kinds of stuff. But anyway, uh, I wish I could preach like Brother Jonathan because he fires me up. The Spirit of God gets on him and he just, my, I just want to, I want to just mm, run and holler sometimes because he excites me so with the Word of God as he brings it. But maybe this is a day to contemplate, slow down and think to dig a little deeper. You know, there's times for shouting, and there's times that the Lord says, be still, be quiet, listen. And I say for these older saints of God, when you think that your vessel is broken, that is the time for you to shine the most. When you think that you're at the last, you know, I just lost an uncle this past week, and it seems like death has come in our family, a close family friend, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and then my uncle passed away. And but he, for fifty years, he's worked at one church in South Carolina as the custodian, head custodian. They have a church, uh, K through four years of Bible college. They got schools. They got a children's home. They, you know, he's the chief mechanic. He was the chief mechanic. He was it kept everything running and operating around there for over fifty years. Truly a servant that there ever was one. And I just want to say that, you know, he, I think he shined the most at the end. I think he, he testified most at the end. But anyway, I thank God.